Good morning. It's wonderful to be with you. Here we are to study the book of Judges for two hours. In two hours, we're going to get through this whole book. And our goal to do this is to teach believers to think so Christianly that they find the moral courage to act with integrity as Christ followers, even in the face of opposition. So, you know, I'm Sarah Sumner, and the leader here of Right On Mission, and my own mission statement is to build integrity in the church. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I want to see people bet on God. And my underlying belief, I'm going to call this a belief statement, a why statement, is that I believe God surprises us with yet another jackpot every time we truly trust in him. And so I want people to trust God, and I'm here to show you things about God from the scriptures and stories of people who know God in this um, Judges, this book of Judges. And so we just have a small group here today, and we get to all look at this together. And so I have a Bible open here. I have a Spanish Bible, too. I won't be looking at it so much, but if you get your Bible open to the book of Judges, I have a worksheet here for you, and this worksheet's got a lot of details on it. And this worksheet includes a lot of a lot of other verses while we're trying to define what does judge mean. Okay, and so in my doctoral training, what we did was we learned how to find out what the word means, not by looking in the dictionary, but by looking at how the word's used. And that's what you can do, too. If you really want to do a study that is, is how a dictionary even finds out what the answer is, is you look at the usage of the word. So I went through through the Hebrew on this, on this word shapat and looked up all these different verses that you'll see on numeral, numeral three, judges. So we're going to look at all that. Then we're going to look at B. We'll look at a very brief history of Israel, and then we're going to go right into Judges, and then we'll look through every one of the stories of the Judges. We won't go through all of them in detail. Today's going to be a little bit different, so I'm going to be inviting some participation. I'll guide you through, but especially at one point, we're going to be, we're going to be participating in Deborah's song, The Judge Deborah. We're gonna we're gonna go through her song, and I'll show you what it what it was like more for in a Hebrew context. And then we'll be scrolling down to page four. So I'm assuming everybody's got a worksheet, right? We'll be scrolling down to page four, and I've I just wrote some notables in the Book of Judges, and I have a little question mark because the Book of Judges is famous for being a problem time in history. And it's famous for saying, well, we had one woman judge there because that was such a problem time in history. And I'm putting a question mark beside that. Uh, there's a lot of activity of women in judges, but we'll soon see there's really just one woman who was a judge. And so it's not like, oh, this was a time when there were all these women in leadership and, as opposed to when there's normally men. It's, it's, it's a pretty normal time with regard to men and women but there, it's, it's, a, it's a time that is very similar to what we have today in some ways that are striking. Now, I've been saying that for the last probably 15 years that we're moving into a time that's like the judges. But probably today, of, of all the days in the whole United States history, within the last really two weeks and up into today, it's maybe more like the time of the judges than we've ever seen with regard to people calling for defunding of the police. And then with regard to this um, horrible murder of George Floyd, because in the book of Judges, there's a horrible murder and it happens toward the end. And it's just as, just as riveting at a national level um, it, it's and it, it's so tragic. It just takes your breath away. Just just like the um, George Floyd murder, he literally had his breath taken away. And you may have seen the, the throngs of people on their bellies in Denver, all saying, "I can't breathe. I can't breathe." If you saw that in the news, they were symbolically 
acting out uh, in in solidarity with the um, of the horror of and 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 how terrible this has been. And so our nation is in agreement that this is bad, that that this murder is bad. And you'll see in in judges there that the other tribes of Israel agree that this was, this was a really terrible thing that happens to this woman. So we have five a, a five page worksheet, and at the very end we're going to do takeaways. And so I hope that everybody here, like right now, if you take a little picture in your mind of how well you know the book of Judges, and then let's see in about an hour and 55 minutes how much better you know it. Okay, so I'll see how far we get. I could talk about this all day for sure. And our worksheet, if we go through every detail, will take longer than two hours. So some people who like to go through the worksheet in every detail, we're not going to go through it in every way, but you'll have a little bit more of a written resource than that we'll go through specifically. The goal of today is for you to be able to read the book of Judges with understanding. So we're going to read through it together. And the first thing we're doing is looking for the definition of the word judge. The book of Judges is about judges. And the judge, the word judge in Hebrew is shafat. And it's S-H-P-A-T. S-H-A-P-H-A-T, if you look at that in English. So the first time the word judge appears in the Old Testament is in the book of Genesis. And when you look at these two passages, which I have here, I have three of them, this six, Genesis 16.5, Genesis 18:25 and Genesis 31:53 all three times it's the the judge is, is referring to God and they'll they say something like may God judge between you and me in this case or if God is the judge of judges so i want you to notice in that first book God is the judge and already in the second book of the Bible if you go to Exodus if we look in Exodus chapter 18 you'll start to see that God is inviting us to judge and it wasn't just us it was really um, Moses but it's going to spread out to the congregation and this is this should be kind of riveting to get uh, for us to think so Christianly that we find the moral courage to act with integrity as Christ followers, even in the face of opposition, we need to see from the very get-go that judging is a Christian thing to do if you judge in a righteous way. There's a worshipful, beautiful, constructive, beneficial, helpful, necessary, needful, um, life-giving way to judge. And then there's a condemnatory way to judge. And we don't want to do the condemning. We don't want to do the selfish judging. And when people today say, don't judge me, we're trying to say, don't have that condemnation, that, that, that self-exaltation, self-righteous kind of evil judgment. But there's a good judgment. And I think the world has forgotten about it. And the church has overlooked this. And, and the book of Judges is going to help us remember this. And especially if we get it in context. So if you look in Exodus chapter 18, we're, we're studying the book of Judges, but we're starting out first in the book of Exodus. And in Exodus chapter 18, verses 13 through 16, you see this is when Moses was in charge of all of Israel. And everybody was coming to him with his problems so he could judge what to do. And you see... In Exodus chapter 18 and verse 13, and it came about the next day that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood about Moses from morning until the evening. So this was taking a long time. Verse 14, now when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, what is this thing that you're doing for the people? Why do you sit alone as judge? And all the people stand about you from morning until evening. And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, it comes to me, and I judge between a man and his neighbor, between a person and, an, and, and their neighbor, and I make known the statutes of God and his laws. 
So you remember that story, and Jethro, who's Moses' father-in-law, says, well, you know what? Why don't you get other people to help you do that? And this was a big lesson in Moses' life, and so he actually does that. Now, if you go into verses um, 17 through 22, you'll see that Moses' father-in-law says, the thing that you're doing is not good. And so if you go down to verse 22, he says, why don't you let the people judge at all times and let it be that every major dispute they'll bring to you, but every minor dispute they themselves will judge. And so now in order to teach them to judge, we got to back up and look in verse 20, because what he says is Jethro says, listen, he goes, I'll give, I'll give you the counsel and God be with you. He's, but what you need to do is you need to teach them the statutes and the laws. If you teach people God's laws, they can do the judging. And so we can look at this today and go, judges need to be informed. They need to be well taught. And you don't judge on behalf of your own judgment. It's a judging isn't giving your opinion and asserting your will or your bias or your prejudice. What you're doing is going, I'm going to honestly learn what God wants. I'm going to learn his law and I can judge by his law. I'm going to be doing something on behalf of God. And this is something that you can see already the people were doing, the people of God back here in Exodus. And, and we're going to see this is, this is going to apply to us even today. And so in Judges chapter 18, verse 26, they judged the people at all times. He chose these able people. Moses has a set of judges, and they, and they judged the people at all the time, all the times. And then the difficult dispute they would bring to Moses. Okay, now let's go to Leviticus. So it starts out with Moses is the judge, and now it, it starts out God's the judge, then God has Moses be the judge, then Moses appoints these able people, he teaches them the law, and they become the judges. And now we're going to watch that expand to Leviticus chapter 19. And if you go there in verses 1 and 2, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to all the congregation of the sons of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Everybody here should revere your father and mother. Everybody here should keep the Sabbath. And in verse 4, do not turn to idols. Everybody should not turn to idols, right? He's, he's, he's going on with this. And now when you go down to verse 15, and my point is he's saying everybody, everybody, everybody. And then in verse 15, he says everybody. Verse 15, you shall do no injustice in judgment. He doesn't say don't judge. He says don't be unjust when you judge. You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor defer to the great. But you are to judge your neighbor fairly. You shall not go about as a slanderer among your people, and you're not to act against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your fellow countrymen in your heart, you may surely reprove your neighbor, but you shall not incur sin because of them. Verse 18, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. When you judge, you judge according to justice, according to God's law. It is a way of loving people. Not with partiality. Partiality isn't loving. Just because somebody is poor doesn't mean that that person gets to come steal something. Just because somebody is rich doesn't mean they can bribe the judge and get away with it. If you're poor or you're rich, either way, you are equally subject under the law of God, according to God, with God saying, I am the Lord. So he says, don't slander. You don't get to say something for the purpose of tearing someone down. But you can reprove them. And reprove does not mean beat up. Reprove means expose. You expose what was wrong. And what you're doing is you're showing them. It's an act of love. You reprove by showing that something doesn't match God's law. You're judging what you did 
doesn't match how God is commanding us to live. So I'm exposing that so we can get it corrected so that we can all love each other. And the whole idea is everybody flourish, everybody do this unto God. So you can see this reflected in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 17. And this is when Jesus says, if anybody has, if you've been offended by somebody, you go to the verse, you go to the person who offended you in private. You do this with a brother in Christ, a sister in Christ, a Christian. This is for this. Remember, we're talking about God's people in the Old Testament, people who fear God. These are the Jewish people. And in the New Testament with Jesus, we're talking about people who are who are confessing that Jesus is the Messiah. So this is this is not our relating necessarily to people who do not choose to follow the Lord, who do not believe in God, who don't know God, and they're not professing that of themselves. But for those of us who do, then in that New Testament mandate, Jesus says you reprove them, you expose. And it takes judgment to be able to even discern that there was something that happened that didn't follow God's law, right? So now if we go on, we're going right through the Pentateuch, let's go through Numbers. And when you get to Numbers chapter 35, look in verse 15. In, in Numbers chapter 30, 35, there's going to be cities of refuge. This is God's law. So God made it to where there would be a place for people to go if they needed to flee because something went really terribly wrong. And that means like if they killed somebody and there's a law of what you do if they killed them on purpose and then a law if they didn't kill them on purpose. So let's look on verse on verses 22 through 24. If somebody pushed somebody suddenly and they did it without enmity, without hate, they didn't do it with malice, but they threw something at somebody and they weren't lying in wait, but they, they threw something and it hit somebody and they and they and they did this without any deadly object of stone and they did it without seeing it dropped on him so that he died and it, the person wasn't the enemy they 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 were they were not seeking your injury but but somebody got killed because you threw something at him but you didn't mean to be killing him it says in verse 24 then the congregation now we're past appointed judges. The whole congregation shall judge. The congregation shall judge between the slayer and the blood avenger according to these ordinances. So you see already we've moved from Genesis, God is the judge, to Exodus, Moses is the judge, to Moses choosing judges, able people that he taught the law of God to, all the way Expanding out now to the whole congregation judging, you can't judge correctly if you don't know God's laws. This is why we need to know God's laws so that we'll be able to judge each other, help each other for the sake of loving each other. This is righteous, loving, community building judgment. If we don't have that, we end up with chaos and violence. Let's go to Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy becomes very explicit right here in chapter 1. The scriptures say it so plainly. In verse 16, it starts out, and it just simply says this. It's a review. This is Moses reviewing what God has, has done through him. And Moses reviewing, saying, I charged your judges at that time saying, hear the cases between your fellow countrymen and judge righteously between a person and that person's fellow countrymen, or even through the alien. Just because you're a national and somebody else is an immigrant or they're a foreigner visiting doesn't mean that you get to be partial to the person who lives here. Everybody's under the judgment. So if you live here or if you don't live here, the justice applies to everybody and it's equal. So there's no partiality for the person who lives here or against the person who doesn't. This is the way God commands us to live. You can see a little bit more of this in chapter 16. Deuteronomy chapter 16, when you go to verses 18 to 20. 
you shall appoint for yourself judges and officers in all your towns, which the Lord your God is giving you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people, here it is, with righteous judgment. You shall not distort justice. You shall not be partial. You shall not take a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and perverts the words of the righteous. Justice and only justice you shall pursue. Here's why. So that you can live. Because if you don't pursue justice and you don't do it God's way, somebody's going to get killed. People are going to get hurt. We're not going to be loving each other. So it doesn't matter if, if you're a man or a woman, if you're rich or poor, if you're young or old, if you're a foreigner, or if you're, or, or if you're a, a countryman, if you have good health, if you have poor health, it doesn't matter. You're under the same laws of God's justice, and his laws are nuanced to take into account differences, different situations, and what the, what the motive was. And the, and, the, and the whole idea is judging again with righteous judgment. Chapter 17, you see it again. Look in verse 9. So you shall come to the Levitical priest or the judge who's in office in those days, and then you, require, you inquire from the judge. And you find out, man, if you don't follow what the judge says, uh-oh, then you're, the, we can't have that. We're not gonna we're not gonna be able to flourish and live together unless we go. We're gonna have to have righteous judgment and we're gonna have to comply with the judge. You can read the rest of that and see for yourself what, what it says. Deuteronomy chapter 19, when you get down to verse 16, if a malicious wit witness rises up against a person to accuse them of wrongdoing, if somebody's gonna be a false witness, they're not there to help render justice. They're not there in the court. They're not there to say, look, I know something more about truth, but they're a malicious judge and they're against you. Look, it says in verse 17, Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 17, then both of the people who have the dispute shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who will be in office in those days, and the judges shall investigate thoroughly. And if the witness is a false witness, and he's accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to that false witness just as that false witness had intended to do it to his brother. Thus you shall purge the evil from among you. God is very strict. Wouldn't that be something if on our culture today, say if you falsely accuse somebody and the judges thoroughly investigate and they find out that was false, then whatever it is you plotted for that person, that happens to you. If you accuse somebody of a crime, crime and they might have gone to prison for 20 years then now you go to print 20 you go to prison for 20 years because you did this and you knew you were lying it's a very serious thing and 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 it's not going to be the truth won't be found out unless the judges investigate thoroughly so you can already see how broken our system is today our our judicial system is broken and you can see more of this in chapter 20 uh, at down i mean in in uh in 21, um, 1 and 2, and chapter 25, verse 1. But let's go all the way to the book of Joshua. Because you're seeing self uh, judging righteously is thematic in the Pentateuch. The Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's thematic. The Pentateuch is really sets the tone for the whole Old Testament. And this is this is this is not just one little verse. It's it's thematic. Now let's go to Joshua, because if you go to Joshua chapter eight, verse thirty, and we're going to look verses verses thirty through thirty five, you'll see Joshua builds an altar to the Lord. And just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the the sons of Israel as it's written in the book of the law of Moses, then they offered sacrifices according to those standards. And in verse 32, Joshua wrote there, Joshua wrote there on the stones, a copy of the law of Moses, which he had written in the presence of the sons of Israel. 
Verse 33, and all Israel with their elders and officers and their judges were standing on both sides of the ark before the, Levitical, the, before the Levitical priests who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Look at this, the stranger as well as the native. And again, we don't get to say, hey, I, I'm a citizen, so I get away with this, and you're not a citizen, so you don't. No. According to God, everybody, everybody counts. You have to love everybody. We all matter. And, and the law applies to everybody. And if we don't have a copy correctly of the law and we don't know what that law says, we won't be able to apply righteous judgment to the situation so that we can love each other. And of course, we know that's the golden rule is to love one another. So it says in verse 35 in Joshua chapter 8, there was not a word of it. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded, which Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel with the women and the little ones and the strangers who lived among them. It's the men and the women, the young and the old, the citizens, those who are not citizens, everybody going, here's how we live together. This is how Christians can show ourselves differently, to be different than the world going, having this justice applied to everybody. Okay, so we're going to talk in depth about the book of Judges, but let's go to Ruth because you're going to see this again. And it's not very often pointed out. You know this book of Ruth. This is Ruth and Boaz. Remember that story? And it starts with, with her with her mother-in-law. Well, we'll go through the book of Ruth in two hours one of these days. But look at this first verse. Now, it came about in the days when the judges governed. That's when there was a famine in the land. And that's when the story of Ruth took place. It was during the time of the judges. Now, let's go to 1 Samuel because this is even less pointed out. It's just not a, a something that, that, that you hear a whole lot about. But if let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 18, normally we think of Samuel as the first prophet. And Samuel was a prophet. But if you look in 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 18, you find out that even before Samuel, there's still a judge. And remember, he has these interactions with Eli the priest. Look at this. First Samuel, verse 4, chapter 4, verse 18. And it came about when he mentioned the ark of God that Eli, Eli the priest, fell off the seat backward, and his neck was broken, and he died. Thus, Eli the priest judged Israel for 40 years. So I don't have Eli written down as one of the judges in the book of Judges because he's not in the book of Judges. He's, book in, the, he's in the book of 1 Samuel. And now if you go to chapter 7, you're going to see very plainly stated in 1 Samuel chapter, chapter 7, verse 6, there's a situation going on and at the end of that, it says, and Samuel judged the sons of Israel at Mizpah. So now here's Samuel, who we think of as a prophet, and the Bible says that he judged. If you look in verses 15 through 17, you'll see, oh, 1 Samuel chapter 7, verses 15 through 17. Now Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. And he used to go annually on circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mizpah, Mizpah, and he judged Israel in all these places. Then his return was to Ramah, for his house was there, and there in his house in Ramah is where he judged Israel. And he built there an altar to the Lord. So we have a, a fuller understanding now of the range of the judges. And then you get into first, uh, Second Samuel and First Kings and 
you start to say, oh, some of these kings are judging. And the Bible says that the kings judged. You can look those verses up later. And you'll see it goes all the way even into Ezra. Now, Ezra was a scribe. And what did he do? He wrote down the law. So it makes sense that you would say, oh, where we're going to write down the law, we don't just write it down so we memorize it. We don't just go to seminary so you can brag that you know all this stuff. The point, and it says this over and over and over, especially in the book of Deuteronomy, the point is to live it. You've got to know it so you can live it. And the judgment comes when someone didn't live it or when someone accidentally didn't live it or when we get confused about what it means, then you have to judge. So judging is to correct us so that we can get our behavior and our motives, our attitudes and our relationships all to align with the law of God, which is all meant to benefit every single person at every age, born or unborn. And we, that we do this in a way that is loving to everybody. Now, when you get into Psalms, we're going to start to see that God is a judge. We've had a hint of that in the book of Genesis, but I have some verses written down for you like Psalm 7, 11, and, and the whole, a whole line here, and, and, and I wrote it out. God is a righteous judge. You can look up all those verses. As God is a righteous judge, so God commands us and expects us to be righteous judges. And again, if we have a society where the people who go to church, the people who say they're Christians, don't know the law of God, we won't be able to judge. And sadly, what I hear is I hear people who profess to be Christians say, oh, I'm not going to judge. Oh, I won't judge. And we, um, we're bragging that we're being remiss and we don't know the law to even know that this is not something to brag about. And it's like we're relieving ourselves saying, see, I'm like, I'm like the people who don't know God instead of like, oh, wait, I need to be like Moses who did know God and who interfaced with God. And no, we can do this with moral courage if you can see it yourself in your own copy of the scriptures. And you're not just taking it as my opinion or someone else's opinion, but you're taking it straight from the scriptures. And that you can go beyond just, just being acquainted with it. You can have knowledge. You can know this. But you got to know God's God, God's law. Okay, so now, well, there's a whole theme also that says not only is God a righteous judge, but God will judge us. And a lot of the fear of the Lord is going, you know what? You might have gotten away with snitching that little thing you stole. God knows you stole it. You might have told that little lie and nobody caught you yet. God knows you lie. It might be a big lie. But God knows, and God will judge us later. And this puts the fear of the Lord in us to God saying, look, it's not okay with me if you're, if you're going against my law. Because when you do that, you're harming yourself and you're harming somebody else. And God doesn't want that. And now God gets this reputation for God not caring about us, but God is actually very invested in caring about us, and God, God wants us to be invested in that for each other. Okay, now you'll see in, in Proverbs chapter 8, and you see it again in Proverbs 31, King Lemuel's mother's training him to be a king, and she tells him, open your mouth and judge righteously. If you're going to be a good kind of king, you know, if we looked at all these verses, you would see back in Deuteronomy and in, in chapter 17, I believe, where the king was supposed to write down. When you become the king, you've got to write down the law. You have to write it down with your own handwriting. You've got to know that law. You wrote it down. Because if you're going to judge according to that law, you've got to know what that law is. So, you know, Solomon prays, dear Lord, please help me to be a good judge on this. Now, you start finding in Isaiah these judges who are rebels. And if you have lawyers, judges, institutional leaders, church leaders, people who are supposed to be judging righteously to protect the people and they're not doing that, this stirs up the anger of, and the wrath of God because he doesn't want people to be taken advantage of. He doesn't want us to be exploited and hurt, hurt and harmed. And if we don't have righteous judgment, it's going to happen. God is even for lawsuits. You can see this, and you see it in the book of Lamentations. You see it also in Isaiah. Look at this in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 4. The Lord is complaining that no one sues righteously. And there's a, there, the, the, the implication is there's a way to sue righteously, to file a lawsuit and do it in a righteous way. 
and there's a way to do a sloppy pot shot kind of a, a malicious lawsuit that isn't there for justice, but you're just trying to harm someone. You're trying to run up their legal bill. You're trying to falsely accuse them. You're trying to use the system against them instead of promoting justice. So judging is for justice and justice is for love. God is commanding you judge with righteous judgment and you defend the needy, you defend the orphan, you defend the widow. We hear so much in our culture about fatherlessness. Where are the fathers? God cares about the fatherless. And, and, and he's especially angered when someone doesn't take care of someone who doesn't have a father who was there who was supposed to be loving them. It's scary. When you get a bribe, we have different ways of contriving bribes, I believe, in our culture. And sometimes that's just in the form of a paycheck. It's a form of a bonus. It's a form of a raise. Just keep your mouth shut. You see this corruption happen. If you want to keep your paycheck, that would be your bribe. Then just go along with the injustice. That is absolutely defying God's ways. You read that Old Testament, you see it over and over and over. Micah, a minor prophet, chapter 3, verse 11, they pronounce a judgment for a bribe. Don't you dare say something that's untruthful. Don't you dare participate in something like that just because they're going to take away your paycheck. We don't serve money. We're not serving mammon. We're serving God. And Jesus says it's impossible to serve God and mammon at the same time. In Zephaniah, it gets so bad in chapter 3, verse 3, it says, their judges are wolves. They're not really judges. But it says, the Lord is righteous within her. And right when people are saying God doesn't care, God's pointing out these judges are wolves, and I'm not like them. Read, the, read that in Zephaniah. You probably haven't read that in a while. We'll go through that, and we'll do Zephaniah in two hours. But right now, what I'm pointing out is you'll see these contrasts of right when the people are sending up a storm and, and a contrast in how God is and that God disapproves and that God will judge our lack of righteous judgment and our, our unwillingness to. Okay, so we're already now to be the history of Israel. So we're in the history of Israel. I just want to remind you what you have is you know, you got Adam and Eve, and, and we went through this when we did the whole Bible in two hours. But very shortly in the book of Genesis, all the way just, and really, you, 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 he's, the, he's the main character besides the Lord in Genesis 12. So you meet Gen Abraham's family in Genesis 11, and in Genesis 12, you've got Abraham, and Abraham is who God chooses to be the father of the Jews. And remember the first Jewish person isn't Abraham, Abraham's of the Chaldees. The first Jewish person is, remember, it's Isaac. So you've got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And so often God identifies God's self by being the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because that's the lineage. And Isaac had twin sons and Jacob is one of them. And so it could have been the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau, but it's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it doesn't mean God doesn't love Esau. It just means that Jacob is the one who's the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. And, and we're going to see a lot. If you don't know who those tribes are, when you read the book of Judges, you're not going to recognize, oh, Ephraim, oh, that's a tribe of Israel. Oh, Asher, oh, Naphtali, oh, Benjamin, oh, these are all sons of Joseph, I mean, sons of Jacob. Oh, I see, we're talking about the 12 tribes of Israel. If you know those 12 tribes, it'll make a lot more sense to you when you read the book of Judges. That takes it a little further than we're going to go, so I just wanted to mention that. But we could go through that in much more detail, line by line, if we were going to read the whole book of Judges. But you see on your worksheet, Jacob's 12 sons that include Judah and that include Joseph. But remember, Joseph goes out of the picture, and they end up getting Ephraim and Manasseh, which are Joseph's sons, instead. And then, remember, Joseph is the one who is raised up. He, the brothers betray him, and the next thing you know, he's 
basically running the whole country of Egypt and saving their lives and giving them food and stuff. And so it's after Joseph is in charge and then he dies. And very soon after that, God raises up Moses. And, and the, the mandate was to kill all the babies, but Moses' mother, Jochebed, she doesn't do that. She puts the little tar pitch and she put, makes a little boat for Moses and he's floating down the river and he gets pulled out of the river by the, by the Pharaoh's daughter. And so Moses ends up being very well educated and then God uses him. He has a, he has a pretty dramatic life history, but God uses Moses to lead people to the promised land. And what you see in the books of Exodus, uh, uh, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, uh, Numbers and Deuteronomy is Moses interfacing with God. And nobody's ever done that like how Moses did. Moses is the one where we got the Ten Commandments. Moses was all part of that story. And remember, we just read that Joshua wrote down everything that Moses had given, that Moses got from God. So then Moses gets to take him to the promised land, but Moses has a sin. Moses isn't Jesus. Moses needs to be saved just like everybody else. And God takes him up, and Moses goes up to the top of the hill, and he finally gets to see this promised land, the very land that had been promised to Abraham. He gets to see it, but he doesn't get to go in. And the person he hands the baton to is Joshua. And the whole book of Joshua is Joshua going into the land that God has promised them. And now scholars are, are scholars get very tripped up by all this because when Joshua leads the people in, there are already people there. And God says, look, I'm going to take you to vineyards that you did not plant. And you're going to live in cities you did not build. And the point of it scripturally is God saying, I gave this to you. And I don't want you to think that you got it for yourself. You got it for me. But the way it gets translated in our, our, our culture in 21st century is scholars going, oh, no, they went and trampled these people. There are these terrible, bloody, awful murderers, and they're so awful. And instead of understanding, God is bringing them in because God's the God. And everybody, we got our breath from the Lord. And if God says, you get to live here now and you don't get to live here now, then we, then we say yes to God. Now think about this. If there's such a strict punishment, which I didn't explicitly say, but there's such a strict punishment that you don't follow the judge. Remember in Israel said that God raised up judges. And if you don't follow what the, what the judge says, uh-oh, you're in trouble. I mean, you actually, they would say, that's it. You're going to die. Because how are we going to have order in the land if we have a righteous judge and the righteous judges are judging according to God's law and then you just simply will not go along with it? Then you can't participate. You can't live. Because if, if you won't let everybody else live, then you don't get to live. And living means that we love each other and that we really follow God's law. And so now if, if God is that strict when we don't follow the human judges how much more when we don't follow the big j judge god the judge and god going i require you to live right now i've set before you life and death and i'm telling you, you can die but i'm telling you if you want to live then this is how you're going to have to live because it's the only way of life god's god's laws lead to life sustain life undergird life it's just the way life is. It's a realistic, truthful way. It's, there's nothing arbitrary or unreasonable about it. And the more we see scripture and the more we understand God and know him, we know that's, that's, that's true. So Joshua goes in, leading the people. They settle that promised land, and they're having battles. And in Judges is the continuation of that. And in and, and Judges, we find out when, when Joshua went in there to take and possess the land that God had already promised to them, when he did that, God very specifically left certain people there that were not conquered by Israel. And that's where we start with the book of Judges. Okay, 
So now let's look at my let's let's look at the clock. We have we're going to get through judges in two hours, and we spent 50 minutes just prepping for judges. Okay. Now the reason why we did that, I want you to notice the time, is that when you understand the context of a book of the Bible, when you see how the that book fits with the rest of the Bible, it's way easier to read it with understanding. A lot of times people come to the Bible and they're going, I'm trying to read this. I have no idea what's going on. And it's because you've coming into the middle of a story and you don't know who's who or what's happened or what's loaded. You don't understand what means a lot. Nothing reminds you of something before because you don't know what happened before. You don't see what lies at stake. So that's why I'm trying to give you a pretty elaborate start so that now we can look through some of these details and see. So I'm going to hold my Bible up so you can remember I'm getting this right out of Scripture. All right, is everybody with me? We're on letter C on page two of your very elaborate five-page worksheet. Okay, you with me? So on Judges... Chapter 2, verse 1. Now, wait a second. Why aren't we starting with ch chapter 1? <laughs> the reason why we're not is because it's going to be easier if we start with chapter 2 because you have a teacher. So let me just give a quick word. Scriptures teach us that people need teachers. In the Bible, they had teachers. Moses was their teacher. Moses got taught by God. And then Moses came and taught, and he taught the judges, and the judges taught the people. And next thing you know, the whole congregation is the judge. The whole congregation knew enough they were taught. And our job is to go, all right, I'm going to get taught, and then I'm going to go teach, and we're going to get to where all the little seven-year-olds also know the law, and they can also help teach. So that everybody knows. And God isn't saying we're going to have a secret thing where, ha, 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 I get to know, and I'll tell you the secret thing, and I'll be in charge, and I'll manipulate this, and I'll make it work for me. That is not. Christian. But instead, and so what I'm doing is saying as a teacher, I think it's going to be a little easier if we just go ahead and let's look at Judges chapter 2, verse 1. Now the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim. And that angel said, I brought you up. Now this is the angel of the Lord speaking on behalf of God. Like God saying, I brought you up out of Egypt where you were slaves when Joseph was in charge. I brought you up out of Egypt and I led you into the land which I've sworn to your fathers. And I said, I, God, will never make my, will never break my covenant with you. And as for you, you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. I'm bringing you into this land and there are people already here and they're not worshiping me. They're worshiping other gods. And I'm telling you, I'm bringing you here and don't make a covenant with them. Do not, it get it, do not involve yourself worshiping their gods. Don't do it. It's not the way to live. It's not the way to obey God. Okay, now I wanted you to see that he brought them, what does it say right there in the middle of that verse? He brought them into the land. And the more you understand the Old Testament, you'll see the land is a big deal. God is a God of place. He cares. There's a word that you could think is just not a big deal word, and it's a big deal in the, in, in the Old and the New Testament, and it's T-H-E-R-E, -E, there. I want this to happen there, and this happened there in that place. It's right there. When you see the word there, you should go, oh, oh, this is important. It's there. Okay, and right here, we don't have the word there, but we have the, the, the referent of it's into the land. I brought you up out of Egypt, and I led you into the land. And this isn't just any old land. It's the land that I swore to your fathers. I told, Je I told Abraham, says God, right, in Genesis chapter 12, I'm going to give you land. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you to a place. You don't even know where you're going, but I want you to follow me. I'm going to take you to a land, and it's going to be a promised land. And then they get put into slavery in Egypt. God brings them out of Egypt. Moses is the leader. And Moses gets to go up on the mountain at the end and see the land, but he doesn't get to go into the land because of his own sin. 
we'll get to that when we when we do Deuteronomy in two hours. But now let's look, and and I'm looking right on your sheet. In, jo in Judges chapter one, Joshua is dead. In Judges chapter two, Joshua is alive. So if somebody is trying to read the Bible and they don't have a teacher, they could go, oh no, this is all jumbled. So here's one of two things, either I'm stupid or this Bible is all messed up and I shouldn't believe it. And really neither one of those are the case. The case is this, you need a teacher because they've compiled this in a different way and we often flash back too. So what happens is you've got, let's look at Judges chapter one, verse one. Oh, hallelujah, we're finally starting with Judges chapter one, verse one. Everybody taking note? We're here. Okay, Judges chapter one, verse one. Now it came about after the death of Joshua. We know what that means. It was after the death of Joshua that the sons of Israel inquired of the Lord and they said, <laughs> they basically are saying, well, God, now what do we do? Moses is dead and Joshua's dead. So who's going to lead us? What do we do? And the question they say is, who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? You've brought us into this land, Lord, but other people are there. And we know from Joshua, we have all these battles and we're supposed to go fight, but we don't know how to do that. We can't do that without you. And we don't know, we don't know who our leader is. We don't know what to do. And the Lord answers, look in verse two, and he says, Judah shall go up. Now, if you don't know that Judah is a tribe, you'll probably think Judah is just one man, but actually it's one of the tribes of, of Israel. Judah is the fourth son of Leah, Jacob's wife, Leah, and Judah, what's, what, what do you know about Judah? What, what is the most What's the most significant thing about Judah that you can think of? He is the lineage of Jesus. That's right. So he's going to be the one, the Christ child, the Messiah's got to be kin to somebody, and it's going to go back to the line of Judah. Okay? So what happens is in, in Judges chapter 1, Joshua's dead. In Judges chapter tap, Chapter two, there's a flashback. So they're saying, who, who, who should go up for us? And the Lord says, okay, it's Judah. So let's look in chapter one, verse six. So what happens is Judah's gonna go up and they're gonna go fight and they, and they, capture, they capture the leader. And his name is Adoni Bezek. And he, and he flees and in verse six, they catch him and they cut off his thumbs and they cut off his big toes. Now the 21st century scholars, 20th century scholars are gonna go, oh, this is terrible. But we could never follow this God who would have somebody cut off somebody's thumbs and somebody's toes. But if you just go to the next verse, look what happens. And, Adon and Adoni Bezek said, 70 kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off, used to gather up scraps under my table. As I have done, so God has repaid me. Now that changes everything. Oh my goodness, this is a king who cut off the thumbs and the big toes of 70 other people and made them eat under his table. He abused people by cutting off their thumbs and their, and their toes. And so now God has Judah come in and you cut off his, finger, his thumbs and his big toes. And God is rendering God's judgment. So before you say, oh my goodness, God is so terrible because he had Judah go in there and cut off the thumbs and toes, you go, well, hold it. If you know the story, then you would understand why this could possibly be righteous judgment. And, and the person who understands is Adoni Bezik. <laughs> he goes, I know why this happened because I know what I did wrong. And God is trying to get my attention and teach me about righteousness. This is not, this is not random arbitrary torture. This isn't a God on the loose saying, hey, I get to do whatever I want that in ways that aren't even good. That's not what's happening here. 
Now let's look in verse 23. In verse 23, you're going to see the house of Joseph spied out Bethel. Okay, let's think about this. All right, we're in the book of Judges. Who's going to go ahead of us? Judah is a son of Joseph. I mean, is a son of Jacob. And Joseph is a son of Jacob also. And so you're going to see that they're going to go up and they're going to capture cities. They're going to capture cities. And in verse 23, you find out that the house of Joseph spied out a city and 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 they they're going ahead to see who they're conquering and if we go to judges chapter 2 verse 6 through 10 you'll see a flashback of when Joshua had dismissed the people the sons of Israel Everybody goes back to the possess the land and the people serve the Lord all the days of Joshua. So in other words, without, when you go back and read this, because what I'm trying to do is not go through it all line by line. I'm trying to set you up to be able to go home and read it and go, I understand this book. I get it. Okay. And what I'm saying is in, Je in, in Judges chapter one, verse one, Joshua's dead. And then you find out they go through, and Judah's going to go capture this Canaanites. You're going to find out more in chapter one of them capturing other cities and that the house of Joseph, Joseph has two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And they're going to go out and they're going to spy these other lands. And then by the time you get to Judges chapter two, there's a flashback of, oh yeah, when Joshua was here, we follow the law of God because we had a moral leader. We had a moral authority figure. We, we followed God pretty much when Moses was the leader and then again when Joshua was the leader, but they're both dead. And now what are we going to do? So in Judges, there's a kind of, we're kind of frantic because we're better at following God when we have a righteous leader than when we don't. And so let's look what happens. Judges chapter 2, verse 8, Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died. He died, and they buried him. In verse 10, Judges chapter 2, verse 10, and all that generation, everybody who was there with, that judge, with Joshua and them, they were all gathered to their fathers. They all died, and there arose another generation, and this generation does not know the Lord. And they don't know the work that God has done. That reminds me of today. We have lots of people today. They're going, uh-oh, a lot of people died. Robbie Zacharias just died. Billy Graham died. Chuck Colson died. Dallas Willard died. A lot of our leaders have died. And now, do we know God? We don't have the leaders that we're used to having. And a bunch of people now don't know God. Okay, so now you can see your, your worksheet. I had the theme is that God wants to give the Israelites the land, but he wants them to keep his covenant there in the land. He wants them to go to that place, to that land where Joshua was leading him to conquer. I want you to go there and I want you to trust me and I want you to follow my law right there when you live in that geographical place. But they turn away from God and they forsake the Lord and they commit idolatry. And it happens again and again. And so I want you to see what happens is they, instead of following God, they go follow the Baals, the B-A-A-L and the Ashtaroth. And the reason why they do that is because that's the gods of the, of the Canaanites. They go in there and the people are worshiping somebody else. And they're just like us. They want to come in. They want to fit in with those people. Why can't we do what they're doing? People like to copy each other and go, I'm impressed with so-and-so. I'll do what they're doing instead of following God's law. The Baal is a, is a god of rain. And if you've been to Israel, you know you really need it to rain because if it doesn't rain, you're not going to have the crops. 
Israel is a land that depends upon rain. We'll talk about that more when we go through the book of uh, this more of the Pentateuch in two hours, especially the book of Deuteronomy. And there's a lie, there's a deception, there's a superstition, there's a false religion going on in the land where God wants them to follow God's laws. And that superstition is, hey, if you'll worship Baal, he'll make it rain. And guess what you do to get it to rain? You have sex with somebody. Isn't that fun? And the Ashtaroth is a, fer is a fertility goddess. And if you worship Baal and Ashtaroth, you do that by having sex orgies. Do you know how fast that sells? That sells like hotcakes. People are like, hey, terrific. Do we want to serve God and be humble and righteous and trust him and do all the things right and love each other? Or do we want to just go have sex and like worship the Baal? Well, you can imagine people so often fall off the wagon and they go do the whole Baal thing. And so what happens is God gives them over and God goes, all right, I told you how to love each other. I told you if you follow my law, you're going to live. You'll stay alive. But you didn't do that. And so now my anger is burning against you because I want you to live. In other words, God gets angry at us when we harm ourselves. And we think God is the one harming us. And God is actually angry at us for harming each other and harming ourselves. We scapegoat and lie and blame God for doing the thing we did. And the more you read scripture, like, wow, Lord, you are not the problem. Our sinfulness, our lack of righteousness, our refusal, our rebellion, our unwillingness to follow your law, that's the problem. You're not the problem. You're a great God and you're a righteous judge. And you're the and you're and you are the lawgiver. So what we see is I want you to see this pattern and in in, in our in Judges two. Let's look at this in Judges two. Let's look at this pattern, starting in verse sixteen. So you can see when I'm talking about God raising up judges, I want you to see I didn't make this up. Find the knowledge and look at it yourself. Judges chapter two verse sixteen. Then the Lord raised up judges who delivered the people from the hands of those who plundered them. So if we say, wait, then God raised up judges who delivered the people, then a judge, a judge is really, my best definition of judge is deliverer. A judge is a deliverer. Because you look, if you look in the dictionaries, they'll say a judge means it's somebody who judges or it's a ruler. And I, and I showed you where the kings judge, Samuel judges, Moses judged. But Moses also delivered the people, right? And you're going to see these judges when God raises them up. They deliver the people because what happens is they go in. They're supposed to be following God's law. While they're following God's law, things go well. Then they end up sending up a storm, and they'll go follow the bales on the Asheroth and do their sex orgies and all that. And when they do that, bad things happen to them, and somebody rules over them who doesn't love them like how God does. And now they get, and they get oppressed, they get stolen from, they get crushed, they get killed, and then they finally they'll cry out to God and go, God, we don't like this. And God is so kind. He's so merciful. Even though they don't deserve it at all, then God ends up saying, all right, I feel for you and God will raise up another judge. So let's look at this. For the example, page two on your worksheet, Judges 2.16, the Lord raised up judges to deliver them. Verse 17, and yet they played the harlot. I didn't make that up. Look at this. Judges chapter two, verse 17, and yet they did not listen to their judges. God raised up judges and they didn't listen to their judges. They played the harlot. Harlot is sex word, isn't it? sexual sin is a big deal. And people go, oh, nobody got killed. It was just sexual sin. And go, yeah, but sexual sin has a whole lot to do with where your heart is. Are you following God? What are you doing with your body? Do you understand how important you are? If you understate how important you are and how important that other person is, if you, don't, if you forget, you might just start having sex and throwing yourself around and bowing yourself down to them 
and their gods. They turned aside quickly from the way in which their fathers had walked in obeying the commandments of the Lord. They did not do as their fathers. Now look in verse 18. And when the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge. God helped that judge help them because God loves them. That's why the Bible says, if God is for us, who could be against us? Verse 19, but it came about when the judge died, they'd turn back and act even more corruptly than they did before. So you have Moses leading them, Moses dies, but the, the, the baton is successfully handed off to Joshua, and they do so well, relatively speaking, because they've got a righteous leader in Joshua, but now Judges is a crisis in the death of Joshua. That's what this book is. We have a crisis because we've lost our righteous leader, and now we don't know what to do. So, so and we have this pattern. We've got judges, then we rebel against the judge, or we, we will do, while we're living with the judge, things go well, then we, then we rebel, then the God will raise up another one, the judge will die, and then we'll be worse than ever. However, the pattern, uh, and, then, and then God's anger comes. Oops, so, so I'm reading it. And then Judge 2.20 looks, so the anger of the Lord burned against Israel. And he said, because this nation has transgressed my covenant, like my promise, my deal with you, my negotiation with you, that I commanded their fathers, and you haven't listened to me, then I'm not going to drive out any, any of these nations anymore. I'm not going to help you. And you're going to have people, you're going to have leaders who crush you and plunder you because you didn't want to have me and my laws. And my laws, they're, it's, going, it's not going to be a sex party. We're going to have to have discipline and we'll have dignity. And that's very different. But you're going to be able to love each other and you'll flourish and you'll love it. Okay, now we're going to see that pattern over and over in the book of Judges. And if you don't read the book carefully, you'll miss it, that the pattern stops. You have that pattern over and over, and you could just start thinking, okay, well, I got the point. Then you go, you got to read the whole book, because this is the pattern, it's 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 the pattern again, and there it is again and again, and then it's not the pattern. And there's no announcement in Judges of, hey, the pattern's done. Things are so bad now that we're not doing the pattern anymore. It doesn't tell you. So you have to pay attention when you're reading scripture and notice what is happening and what's not happening. So let's go to page three on your worksheet. God leaves these nations to test the people, and he even says so. Look at this, chapter three, verse four. God left these nations, verse one. He left them to test Israel, verse four, and they were there. They were for testing Israel to find out if Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord. So I want to ask you, think about there are people in your life, and God has them in your life to test you. Are you going to obey the Lord with this person in your life? Are you going to obey the Lord with this culture pressing on you the way it is? Who's, 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 who's trying to pull you a certain direction? God has that person there for your testing. He wants to know, will you obey me now? Will you choose life now? Will you learn my law now? Because I want you to be able to do it now and now and now. Verses 6 and 7. Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Havites, and the Jebusites. Those are all those Canaanites. And Israel took their daughters for themselves as wives, and he gave their own daughters to their sons, and he served their gods. That's what God told them not to do. He told the king not to do that in Deuteronomy chapter 17. If we knew that, we'd go, yeah, God tells us, don't do that. It's not a, mat it's not a matter of... of it's, it's not a matter of skin color or anything like that. We're talking about what God do you serve? That's what, this is about who is your God? 
Verse 7, and the sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and they forgot the Lord their God. And here it is, they served the Baals and the Asherot. But when the sons of Israel cried to the Lord, here it is, here's the pattern, verse 7, but when the sons of Israel cried to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the sons of Israel to deliver them. He raised up a judge to judge them. And so now let's look at the list here. See, I have this here on page three. I've got all these judges listed. It goes into page four. There's 12 of them, and Othniel's the first one. But let's make sure we fill in this blank. The Lord raised up a blank. And the answer for that blank is, I already said it. A deliverer. So when today when you're thinking, okay, what did I learn? I learned that judges are deliverers. They deliver the people. When the people disobey and then they have unrighteous people, unrighteous leaders or a whole nation or somebody come oppress and steal and plunder from them, take away from them, lead them in an unrighteous way, that happens to them because of their own evil. It, the, and it wasn't God's plan. It's that they didn't go with God's plan. But then God has mercy. He raises up a, a, a deliverer. If you look in Judges chapter 11, verse 6, though, at one point God calls him a chief. So that's why some people would say a ruler is a, a judge is a ruler. You can have a judge be a ruler, a judge, a deliverer. But I still think deliverer is the most accurate word, that that deliverer is kind of like a ruler functions that way. So now Othniel is the first judge that's mentioned in the Bible. And so let's look at this. Judges chapter 3, God raises up a deliverer, Othniel. Oh, it's the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. If you've read before, you, you remember who Caleb is. I won't go into that right now. Judges chapter 2, verse 10, and the spirit of the Lord came upon Othniel. And Othniel judged Israel. Now, some people might call him Othniel. That last two letters, E-L, is in Hebrew means God. E-L, like Bethel, B-E-T-H-E-L. That L is God, Othniel. So however you pronounce Othniel, Othniel, however you say it, just belt it out because we're mispronouncing it probably anyway, which however we say. And Othniel went out to war, and the Lord gave the Kushan, Rishatayim, king of Mesopotamia, he gave him into his hand. And we know, because in Judges chapter 2, verse 16, it says, the Lord raised up judges, and he delivered them from the hands of those who plundered them. Right? And we know it from Judges chapter 2, verse 18, when the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge. So we're not surprised that over here in chapter 3, verse 10, the spirit of the Lord came upon Othniel, and Othniel judged Israel. And when Othniel went out to war, he won. And they won. We could predict that because we got told that right there in the Bible. And the land had rest for 40 years. So let's look at your worksheet. See how I put 40 years on there? I tried to write down the years so you could see how long each judge was. I reread the book of Judges. This, this, I did not write this worksheet by going and finding a bunch of books and compiling stuff I read. This was all original, reading it through and just writing it down for you. You can go back and check my work. He was there for 40 years. That's a long time. Now, then what? What do you think is going to happen? Because I already told you the pattern. What, you, what do you bet is going to happen? They're going to do evil again. And look, we, are, we hardly have to go far at all. Well, all we have to do is go to Judges chapter 3, verse 12. Now, the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Israel does evil, and God himself raises up a bad king to come mistreat Israel. 
to try to get them to understand if you don't live my way, you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer because you didn't choose the right way. And I want you, I want to be your God. And you be my people. So you see this in Judges 3.12. And then what do you think happens? Let's go to 3.15. But when the sons of Israel cried to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for them. He raised up another judge. He raised up Ehud. And you can see Ehud goes after Eglom. And Eglom is so fat, and e Ehud goes in there and he stabs him, and Eglon's so fat, the knife gets all caught in, in Eglon's body, and you don't even see the knife. The knife doesn't even stick out anywhere. He has a knife embedded in his body. It's a gruesome story. But I'll tell you what, it'll get you reading the Bible if you think the Bible's boring, because it's not. This is If we had this as movies, this would have to be um, R-rated for sure. And if you showed it all, it, it might be even worse. Okay, so you can see the pattern happening. Let's look at it again. Look in Judges chapter 3, verse 31. And after Ehud came Shamgar. Shamgar struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad. Shamgar saved Israel. He was a judge. But now let's look in Judges chapter 4. And we've, since we've got all women, this one's kind of especially exciting. Then the sons of Israel, what do you think they did? Verse 1, chapter 4, again, they did evil in the sight of the Lord. When did they do evil? After Ehud died. After they had Shamgar to help a little bit. But when the, when the righteous leader dies, the people are in trouble. Unless they know who's going to be the leader. And the Lord sold them. Who sold them? God did. Do you worship a God who raised up this, this in, in chapter 3, who raised up um, this, it says Eglon, the king of Moab. God strengthened Eglon in chapter 3 because Israel had done wrong, and so God raised up somebody to mistreat him. And now in chapter 4, God sold them into the hand of Jabin, the king of Canaan, who, raised, who reigned in Hazor. And the commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in um, Herosheth Hagoyim. Look what God does. God is very interested in how you're living your life. Because God loves you. And we think, oh, we can be naughty kids and God doesn't care. God cares. And you see this, God raises them up and the sons of Israel cry to the Lord. Already just in verse 3, we got the pattern. Jabin has 900 iron chariots. Now I have this in the notables. In the land of Israel, see Jerusalem is up on a hill. So you'll see that they said they always go up on Jerusalem. When they say up, they really mean it. They'll go all the way up, up, up on the hill to Jerusalem. Well, if you're going up a hill, you can't run chariots on the hill. So anytime they're having a war and they're running chariots, Israel's usually in trouble going, oh, no, what are we going to do? Because we can't run chariots. We've got a whole bunch of rocks, and we've got these, we've got mountains, and down there on the plains by the by the ocean, by the Mediterranean Sea, the, where the Philistines are, they can run their chariots. And so Israel's up in a creek right now because he's got nine he's got nine hundred iron chariots. And look, he oppressed the sons of Israel severely for twenty years. Verse four. Now Deborah, a prophetess, kind of like how Samuel was a prophet, but Samuel was a judge. Deborah is a prophetess, and Deborah is a judge. She's both. She's also a wife of Lapidot. Deborah was judging Israel at that time. Okay, now, I've already said this, but I want it to be in your hard drive, and you, you never forget this. Chapter 2, verse 16, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them from the hands of those who plundered them. 
verse chapter 2 verse 18 when the lord raised up judges for them the lord was with the judge and delivered them the lord delivered them through the judge now what does it say and deborah a prophetess was judging them who chose deborah to be a judge god god did that and people want to tell us oh god would never choose a woman to lead that is absolutely anti to the facts that is contrary to the history of israel that's contrary to the to the inerrant and infallible fully authoritative word of god and as women we know it god did raise up a woman it's not wrong for a woman to lead if it was wrong god wouldn't have done it and god was with the judge and her name was deborah and so deborah's going to go out and she used to sit under the palm tree and people would come to her and they'd come to her for judgment verse five she was wise she knew that tells you she knew the law of god she's she's like a lawyer and a judge and a, and and she's kind of a lawyer and a judge and a queen and a prophetess she's kind of all that stuff she's the religio political leader all at once that god raised up and so she sent and she summons barrett because she's going to get help from him she's like okay we've got jabin and he's got this commander of his armies his name's sister and we got to go get him okay because that's what we're doing and so when this starts to happen you can read the story and what happens is is Barak is saying, well, I don't want to go, but if you'll go with me, then I'll go. So she's like, okay, I'll go too. But now that you've said that, a woman is going to win this battle. And they find out later on in that story that, that verse 11, all of a sudden it starts talking about this guy named Heber. Now Heber the Kenite had separated himself from the Kenites. I'm like, well, wait a second. I thought we were going to go catch Jabin, and I thought this, I thought the, the commander of the army's name is Sisera, and I thought we were going after them. Why are we talking about Hebrew, Heber? Well, we just talk about Heber in verse 11, and then we're done with that, and now we get back to Sisera, and we're, we're talking about this whole battle that they're in. But now, when you get to verse 21, we find this woman named Jael, and Jael is Heber's wife. And the reason why we had to meet Heber is because it was flagging us. Heber's important because Heber's got a wife, and she's going to be that woman that this battle's going to be won through Heber, through, through J-L. J-A-E-L. What does E-L mean? God, right? So J-L's named after God, like Othniel's named after God. Bethel's named after God, Bethel. Okay, and so what happens is when if you read the story, the, the Lord, look at verse 15, the Lord routed Sisera. Sisera is the leader of the army, right? Jabin's the king. Everybody got it? Chapter 4, verse 2. Jabin is the king of, of Canaan. Verse, chapter 4, verse 15, the Lord routes Sisera. He's the commander of the army. God routes him because when God is helped with a judge, God is the one who delivers them. So God's part of the story. He's one in the story. Don't forget to give God credit. And now Barak pursues the chariots of Sisera. And Sisera, all the army of Sisera falls by, this, by the sword. Everybody's dead. Oh, except verse 17, except Sisera. And Sisera run, runs away on foot. And where does he run? He runs to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber. And he's not afraid because he's like, oh, good. I'm over here with the Kenites. And there's peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber, the Kenite. So Sisera's got his guard down. He's like, oh, good. This is going to be fine. And so Jael comes out to meet him and to meet Sisera. And Jael says, turn aside, my master. Turn aside to me. Don't, don't, don't be afraid. And so Sisera's like, oh, good. Oh, hallelujah. It's just you. So she, he trusts her, and she comes in, and he, she hides him under a rug. He's down in a deep place, and there's a rug over him, and she gave him, she gave him, he asked for water, and she gives him curds. She gives him milk. She gives, she makes him fall asleep, and how would a woman do warfare? He's asleep under there, and what does she do? Look at, look at, look at what she does. Verse 21, Jael, Heber's wife, she takes a peg and she seizes a hammer in her hand and secretly she drives that peg 
right into the temple, into his head. And it goes through into the ground. Now, isn't this graphic? And, and when we learned about, Oth the, about Othniel going over to Eg Eglon, or Ehud, I mean Ehud, when Ehud went to Eglon and he stabbed him with a knife, and remember the knife didn't even stick out because Eglon's so fat. Now we find there's a peg going through, and the peg actually goes through his head, and it goes into the ground. This is very, very specific. He was sound asleep. He was so exhausted. He was just zonked, and he died. Verse 22, and, and behold, as Barak, remember Barak is Deborah's helper, he pursued Sisera. Jael came out to meet him and said, come, and I'll show you the man you're, you're seeking. And he went in there with her, and behold, Sisera was lying down dead with the tent peg in his temple. Now look what it says, verse 23. So God subdued on that day, Jabin. God did it, but God did it through a woman. Sometimes God does it through a man. But we're understanding when you follow God's law, when you get raised up by God, then God is the one helping. And even if, even if it looks so terrible where God helped Jesus and Jesus died, God raised Jesus from the dead. So somehow God's going to deliver the way God delivers, even if things look so bad. And the hand of the sons of Israel pressed heavier and heavier upon Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they destroyed Jabin, the king of Canaan. And chapter 5 is all a song of Deborah. And going, yay, hooray, this is our happy song that Deborah was the judge, and this is and it's gonna recount the story. So when you read Judges five, it's gonna explain again what just happened in Judges four. But I want to show you what happens when you read this, because it's gonna say Deborah and Barak, they're singing, and they're saying, The people volunteered, bless the Lord. Now now look at this. Chapter 5, verse 7. I memorized this when I was a teenager. It just inspired me so much. The peasantry ceased. The peasantry ceased until I, Deborah, arose. Until I arose, a mother in Israel. And I remember going, God, make me, I want to be Deborah. I want to be a mother in Israel. She's not the mother of Israel, right? She's a mother in Israel. And verse 9, my heart goes out to the commanders of Israel, the volunteers among the people. Bless the Lord. And you keep reading in verse 15. I love this. There were great resolves of heart. These people were resolved. Look at verse 16. There were great searchings of heart. Judges chapter 5, verses six, verse 16. There were great searchings of heart. And now look at Judges chapter 5, verse 21. Oh, my soul, march on with strength. Even in the English, you can catch how poetic this is. It's a song. And we're celebrating what Deborah did. Now look at this, because we're going to, I want to get you into this. And everybody get psyched, because I'm going to be having you clap. And we're going to do a chant together right out of the scriptures. Okay, Judges chapter 5, verse 24. Most blessed of women is J.L the wife of Heber, the Kenite. Most blessed is she of women in the tent. He asked for water. Sisera is like, oh, oh, please help me. I'm so tired. I've been running. Everybody got killed except for me. I ran and I escaped away from what? Can you get me some water? And she's like, oh, come on and trust me. Hey, remember, we're at peace. Everything's fine. He asked for water, but she gave him milk. He asked for water. She gave him milk in a magnificent bowl. She brought him curds. She reached out her hand for the tent peg and her right hand for the workman's hammer. Then she struck Sisera. She smashed his head and she shattered and pierced his temple. Between her feet, he bowed. He fell. He lay. Between her feet, he bowed. He fell. Where he bowed, there he fell, dead. And now out of the window, she looked and lamented. Now the she isn't JL. It suddenly switches. Look. Out of the window, she looked and lamented, the mother of Sisera through the lattice. It flashes over to Sisera's mother. She's like, what has happened to my son? So this is a book about women. But look, you've got Deborah the judge, the prophetess. You've got Jael the warrior who's espionage saving Israel because God raised her up because Barak said, oh, I don't want to go. Deborah says, you can go, but now a woman's going to get the battle. And you think it's going to be Deborah, but it's not Deborah. It's JL. And now you got Sisera's mother. And you're reading this. It's riveting. 
if anybody thinks the Bible's boring, tells me they A, did not read it, or B, did not read it with a, with a good teacher explaining to them just how riveting this is. Okay, now watch this, everybody. Look at your sheet. I put it here so we'll all have the same version. Page three. Look on page three of your sheet. Between her feet. Now, what, now listen to this, okay, because I'm going to invite you to do this with me. It, and you can start to do it even on mute once you catch on. You can see this rhythm. Between her feet, he bowed, he fell, he lay. Between her feet, he bowed, he fell. Where he bowed, there he fell. Dead. Okay? And so you'll see this is, this is what this chant is like. Okay? We're going to go slowly. Here we go together. Between her feet, he he bowed, he fell, he lay. Between her feet, he bowed, he fell. Where he bowed, there he fell. Dead. I'm going to do it a little bit faster. Ready? Between her feet, he bowed, he fell, he lay. Between her feet, he bowed, he fell. Where he bowed, there he fell. Dead. Okay, so we're going to end on that. So we're going to watch your clap in with mine. We're going to go faster. Between her feet, he bowed, he fell, he lay. Between her feet, he bowed, he fell. Where he bowed, there he fell. Dead. Okay, and so you can imagine them chanting that, right? Between her feet, he bowed, he fell, he lay. Between her feet, he bowed, he fell. Where he bowed, there he fell. Dead. Okay, now we go, oh, my stars. Is this Christianity? Let's see, fast forward to the 21st century, people are going, good grief, this is scary. One time I had a whole group of, I led hundreds and hundreds of women in Campus Crusade, and everybody was saying this. And the leader got back up there and goes, oh my gosh, Sarah, I feel like you're a general. <laughs> and I'm like, but we got to enter the scriptures. We are in a spiritual battle. And there are physical battles, and God is trying to tell us, you are in a treacherous place. Even in the Garden of Eden, there is a crafty serpent who has fallen from Satan, from heaven like lightning. And women, you need to be in this battle. And the church is trying to tell you, you need to paint your fingernails. And the Bible's trying to tell you, you need to learn this chant. And pretty fingernails are fine sometimes. But what really matters is you get in this battle and you learn God's law and you've got to learn to judge righteously. And women can be judges. And as a matter of fact, this is proving it here. And women can even be warriors. We don't fight the same way. We got to wait till they fall asleep and all of this, how, how it worked with, J, with JL. But you get yourself in the game. And I like to say you get yourself in the game. Get yourself in Christ, your new self. If you don't have your mission statement, I highly recommend come to Ride on Mission, get your mission statement, start hanging around with us because we want to help you be a very committed disciple. You can keep coming to these, these Bible things that are free. Okay, so Deborah reigns for, she's, she's the, she judges for 40 years. And then what do you think happens? Chapter 6, verse 1, and the sons of Israel, you can almost guess it, did evil in the sight of the Lord. And so what did God do? God gave them over to the hands of Midian for seven years. And the power of Midian prevailed against Israel. And the Midians, it's going to be bad for Israel. So then let's we could just look at your sheet and guess again. So let's look in chapter 6, verse 13. We're talking about Gideon, and, and Gideon says, oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? If you're with us, God, and we're your people, how could you have let the Midianites be over us? This is not a new question when people say, how could God let this happen to me? Remember, these God left these nations, and why? To test them, to see if they would obey God, to see if they would trust God. Will you follow my law now? Will you learn the law now? Will you judge will you judge righteously now? That's the test. And God wants you to follow it. And it doesn't matter if you're a stranger, an alien, or a man or a woman, or rich or poor or young or old. Get yourself in the game. Get your kids and your grandkids in the game. Everybody's in. And now we have this whole story of Gideon. 
now we could go through this, but we hardly have any time. We only have like 22 minutes, so I'm not going to spend much time on this, but I do want, and I wrote to extend uh, some notes for you to follow. A lot of you know the story of Gideon where God, he, he's so scared. He's like, oh my goodness. And God calls him, oh, valiant warrior. He's like, oh, me? Valiant warrior? I don't feel like a valiant warrior. And remember, God's got it down where he goes, Gideon, your army's way too big. We're going to have to narrow this army down to 300 people. And so he, they go, and, and if anybody goes and gets a drink, he goes, let everybody go get a drink out of the brook. And you can go to that brook in Israel. And if they go down and they put their head down and they drink out of it like a dog, don't choose them. They're not going to be as good at war. But if they, if they cup their hand and do it, then they're going to be better at war. Because if you're drinking and you're cupping, you can look around. You can take your drink and you can see what's going on. But if you put your head down, gulp, 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 gulp. You're not going to be a very good warrior. So there's God is reasonable. So we've got this. There's 300 of them that get chosen with Gideon. And you remember that story? But I want you to see, look in chapter 6, verse 32. So Gideon goes in there. And, and they tear down the statues of the Baal. And remember Baal's that rain god and asheroth is the fertility goddess so all this sex stuff happening you go have sex at the temple of baal and he knocks it all down and gideon wins this and what does his name turn into look at this it's jerubael and a lot of times you just hear that when jerubael doesn't mean anything to you but when you see oh my stars this jerubael so the baal we could say so the B A A L is the Baal. That's how they said it in Texas. When I went to school, they called it the Baal, the B A A L. So the Baal is the Baal. You know, and again, we're probably both of those are probably mispronunciations to really say it in a Hebrew way. But Gideon gets named after the Baal because he defeats him. Isn't that interesting? So there's two more Midian, so, so two Midianite leaders, let's look at your sheet. There's a civil war, the sons of Ephraim. Every time I see the when the sons of Ephraim, I'm like, oh, who's Ephraim's dad? It was Joseph. So make sure you remember that, because remember the house of Joseph went out and spied the land? We had pointed that out. So Ephraim and Manasseh replaced Joseph. They're they're. They were actually the grandsons of Jacob, Ephraim and, and Manasseh. But anyway, there's civil war. So that's why I put sons of Joseph. It's a blank question mark. You fill that in with Joseph. There's two Midianite leaders, Oreb and Zeb, and they both get killed. You read the story of what happened there. Then there's two more Midian leaders, Zeba and Zalumna. And then Gideon, they end up telling Gideon, look, I want we want you to rule over us, okay? And Gideon's like, no, I won't do it. And they press him hard. Finally, he goes, all right, that's it. You guys are driving me crazy. I'm not going to rule over you, but here, I'll make you an idol. Can you believe this? This is Gideon makes an ephod for them. They give him their silver and their gold that he could make an idol, even after all of this. Now, okay, now we can look at them and go, how could they do this? Look in your own life. Why do you sin that sin when you already know? You, you became a Christian. You believe God. He saved you. You stopped doing that other sin. Now, why did you get caught in this one again? Why didn't you trust God again? Why are you so apathetic? And it's, again, we just have to get reminded again, and God knows, man, we have problems. So anyhow, he makes this ephod out of gold. He makes an idol in chapter 8, and this goes on with Gideon as the judge for 40 years, and then he dies. And so what do you bet? What do you guess is going to happen after Gideon dies? Well, there's a civil war. Things are so bad. In, 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 Jud, in Judges chapter 9, there's all this treachery, and what happens is when you don't know who the leader is, sometimes one of the people who don't care or love the people will want to be the leader. 
And it's kind of like Abimelech in Judges 9 is kind of like Absalom in First Samuel. You probably, the Absalom is a lot more famous than, a, than Abimelech is unless you read a lot of poetry. And you'll find there is some poetry about Abimelech. Okay, so that's Judges 9. Now let's look at Judges 10. There's 21 chapters. Oh, my stars, I think we have 15 minutes. We have 17 minutes left, and we're only halfway through almost. Look at this. Judges chapter 10, verse 1, Abimelech died, and Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar. Issachar is one of the tribes of Israel arose to save Israel. So now we've got Tola, and he lived in, in, in Shamir in the hill country of Ephraim. Remember, he lives in the land of Ephraim, which is Joseph's son also. Okay, now this is gonna clip through really fast. Look, you got Tola for one whole verse, and then that's it, Tola's done. Now we go to verse two, and it says, Tola judged Israel 23 years and he died. And now verse three, chapter 10, verse three, Jair, the Gileadite arose and he judges Israel 22 years. It looks like I have a typo. On your sheet, page four, it should say, judge, judge, it should say Jair judges chapter 10, verse three. And so then what happens? Chapter 10, verse 6, then the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. We're not surprised. And in verse 10, then the sons of Israel cry out to the Lord, and they go, we've sinned against you. Oh, no, we've, we've forsaken our God, and we served, not surprisingly, the Baals. They do the same thing again. So what happens is God is going to raise up a judge for them again. So you see in chapter 11, now Jephthah the Gileadite was a valiant warrior. Remember? Oh, Gideon got called O oh, valiant warrior. And now we're like three more judges down the way. And Jephthah the Gileadite, he was a valiant warrior, but he was the son of a harlot. Probably his mama had something to do with the Baals and Asherot. That'd be my guess. His mom's a harlot. But Gilead was the father of Jephthah. And so Jephthah has a hard go because they say, your mother's a slut. You don't get any part of this. Just because your dad is Gilead, the other sons are like, you're bad. We reject you. So verse 3, look at this. Chapter 2, this is about money, isn't it? Chapter 11, verse 2, Gilead's wife bore him sons, and when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah, whose mother is a harlot, they drove Jephthah out. He has a different mother, and they said, you shall not have the money. You shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you're the son of another woman. So Jephthah, verse 3, fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. And these worthless fellows gathered around him, and they went out with him. But, verse 4, it came about after a while, the sons of Ammon fought against Israel. And guess who Israel wants? All oh, they suddenly want to go get Jephthah. Jephthah is really sickened by this. You guys want to kick me out when you want my money. But now that you know I'm a valiant warrior and you're in big trouble, you want me, of all people, to come save you. So think about how humbling that must have been for Jephthah. And Jephthah makes it into Hebrews 11, right? If I tell of Gideon, Barak, Jephthah, Jephthah of Sam, De, Samson, I mean, he makes it into that. So you've got to read this. Now, Jephthah's famous because he, he ends up coming in, he ends up helping in chapter 11, and he ends up going, okay, Lord, and he kind of gets on this high, and he's like, I'm going to dedicate whatever comes to the door. I'll dedicate it to God. And he's like, oh, no. What ends up coming through the door is his daughter. Remember we're talking about judges and women? That's another woman story in, in Jephthah. Oh, it was his, I mean, in uh, Judges, was Jephthah's daughter comes to the door, and he has to sacrifice his daughter. She gets sacrificed. And she's like, oh, but please let me just go out with my maidens. 
for a couple months. Let me go mourn. You can read about her tragic life. Poets have written poet. If you're a poet, read Judges over and over and over, and you can write very interesting poems that have been written before you can write riveting poetry about these tragic lives of people. And so then again, chapter 12, verse 1, then the men of Ephraim were summoned. The men of Ephraim, we've, we've heard of them before because and they crossed over and they said to Jephthah, why did you cross over to fight against the sons of Ammon without calling us to go with you? Hey, Jephthah, what are you doing? So these, you, you'll see this thematically. The sons of Ephraim, are, they're very quick to get mad at the other ones. So they have more civil war. Israel's not getting along because Ephraim's upset again. But Jephthah, he kind of works it out. He's a pretty good diplomat. He takes care of that pretty fast. Okay, so let's go to chapter 12, verse 8. Or let's go to 12, verse 7. Jephthah judged Israel six years. A whole lot happens with Je Jephthah, but he's only there six years. Some of these were there for 40 years, right? The Jephthah, the Gileadite, died. And he's buried with the cities of Gilead. Now, Isben of Bethlehem judged Israel after him. So we have Isben. He's number nine. And then look, already we've got Elon because Isben dies in verse 10. And now we've got Elon. So that's the 10th one. There's 12 of them. Oh, my. Now we're bang. We're already to Abdon. Elon died. And now we've got Abdon. So now we're going to get the last judge that's named as a judge, even though we know Samuel's also a judge, right? Remember that? He's, Eli in the book of 1 Samuel's a judge, and Samuel's a judge. We talked about that at the very beginning. But now we've got Samson, and Sam, Samson's famous for his long hair, his strength, and he's got an issue. And what's his issue? He's got a besetting sin. Sex with the women. He sees them. They're so pretty, he just can't stop himself okay and he's also living in a land right where they serve bales everybody's having sex hey everybody else is doing it why can't i do it too and so even though now what i want you to see is it doesn't say let's see it, it says and let's look at this verse 15 in chapter 12 abdon he's that 11th judge abdon the son of hillel died and he was buried so now chapter 13 starts as we expect. Here's the pattern. Now the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord so that the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Now it seems like it would say, and the Lord raised up a judge for them, but instead it just, we're breaking the pattern. Remember I told you the pattern's going to change? The pattern's starting to dissolve. And instead of it saying, and the Lord raised up a judge, it says, oh, there was a certain man of Zorah of the Danites, the Danites, the Danites. Oh, Dan is one of those tribes of Israel. He's one of the sons of Jacob. And it's the Danites, not the Danites. Oh, yeah. It's the family of the Danites. And this man's name was Manoah, and his wife was barren, and she had borne no children. And then the angel of the Lord appears to the woman. That's interesting. This is a woman's story again. Oh, here's a woman, and the, the angel's visiting the woman. We could read Judges and just think, how many women are there, and how many different stories are there happening to the women in the book of Judges? So Manoah's wife is getting visited by this angel, and the angel says, you know what? You're barren, and you have no children, but you're going to conceive, and you're going to give birth to a son. So be careful. Don't drink wine. No strong drink. Don't eat anything unclean. And don't put a razor to his head. You need to have this child have a Nazarite vow, and you're going to have to give him to God. So verse 6, the woman came, and she tells her husband, oh, my goodness, a man of God came to me, and his appearance was like the appearance of an angel. It was just very awesome, and I didn't ask him where he came from, and he didn't tell me his name. But guess what? He told me I'm going to have a son. And in verse 8, Manoah entreats the Lord, and he says, oh, Lord, please let the man of God whom you've sent, please have him come to us again. We need, to, we need him to teach us what to do. Now, this is a whole different kind of story than what we're used to in Judges. 
And this story goes on for a long time. And so you've got all the rest of chapter 13, and in chapter 14, Samson gets married. Look at this. Chapter 14, Samson went down to Timnah and saw, with his eyes, he saw, saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. If you just read that, and you're like going, okay, and then he goes, da, da, da. If you don't pay attention, you could be bored. But if you're paying attention, you're going, hold it. In chapter 13, verse 1, it says, Now the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. And now you've got this Nazarite boy who's the special angel announced boy, and he goes and gets married to one of the daughters of the Philistines? Yep, he's sleeping with the enemy. This is not dull. Oh my goodness. And he comes back and he tells his father and mother, I saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. So go get her for me. And apparently this is the dynamic that Samson has with his parents. I'm your special kid. Go get this for me. So Samson does these riddles. It's very interesting. He's got this long hair. He's super strong. He's sort of like Popeye, but he's not a cartoon. He's a real person. And now you've got in chapter 15, Samson is having all these escapades with the with the Philistines. And and then what happens to his wife? Well, you'll have to read it and find what happens, but let's go to chapter 16 because you find out that Samson, he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. Now we're talking about women and Delilah's a bad woman. And she talks him into telling the secret. It's a secret of how he has his strength. And she's, she's very manipulative and kind of awful to him. But he gets manipulated by her and he tells. And then they come in and look what happens to him. Judges chapter 16, verse 21. The Philistines seized Samson. They don't just burn him or cauterize his eyes. They literally gouge out his eyes. Now, what was he doing with his eyes before? He's looking at all these women and laying down and having sex with the enemies. And so look what God allows. Remember at the beginning going, oh yeah, God had that guy with the thumbs and the toes got cut off and now God's got the eyes and oh wow, we're learning something about God. You better dedicate your thumbs and your toes and your eyes to God. And God going, I seriously want all of you. And I'm telling you these stories and I let these historical things happen because I'm trying to teach you about spiritual war. I want you to live. I love you. And this is graphic, but you guys aren't very good of students. I'm not a very good student. I keep forgetting. They keep doing evil on the side of the Lord. We keep falling asleep and going, and then I had a glass of wine and fell asleep, and I forgot all about God. And God doesn't want us to do that. Okay, so now we're almost out of time. You can read the rest of Samson. That story is riveting. It's easy to read. The rest of Judges, you're like, okay, I'm done with Judges, but you're not done. And it goes a long time, and it's kind of difficult. And you're like, how am I going to get through these next chapters? Well, it's only five more chapters. But I want you to see what I wrote down here on your, on your sheet, okay? Chat on page four. Now, it's interesting. Chat 17 starts again with a man from Ephraim. We keep hearing about Ephraim. Remember, he's one of those tribes of Israel. We're like, wow, that's interesting. You see Ephraim again. You might want to color code it. Every time you see Ephraim, put it like in light blue or something different from yellow. And a, a man from Ephraim, he comes and he's got this warped mind of a sinner because his mother, she's all, oh, a woman. Oh, my goodness. Ephraim's, okay. What does it say? He's a man is from Ephraim. But his name is Micah, and Micah's mother has this mentality that she's going to do God a favor, and she's, she's going to worship God by making an idol for her son. Okay, this is a warped mind of a sinner. And this happens. 
So already we can see this is a really goofed up story. And now Micah is this man who all of chapter 17 is really about him. And he's going to come in. If you, you kind of scan the story, he had the shrine, verse 5, verse 8. There's a young man from Bethlehem who's a Levite who's staying in a place. Micah's going to have an interaction with this other man. So you, what you have to do is keep straight that there's another man. Look at verse. Look at your sheet on worksheet chapter four. There was no king. Everybody does what's right in his own sight and his own eyes. Samson is dead. There's no Samson. And the Levite priest now is going to be bribed to become a priest to an idol. So you've got Micah has a mother who's making an idol for him. And now Micah's going to try to get a priest for his idol. And when you realize that, you can read through the story a lot easier and that there's no king. It says it again. There's no king and there's no judge. There's no king and there's no judge, and things are going to get worse and worse. The Danites are seeking an inheritance. Uh-oh, they're coming for money. We've heard that before in the book of Judges, too. When somebody's after money, they've got the wrong motivation. The Danites are upset, and they're looking for money. And so what do they do? They come and find this Levite that got hired to be a priest to Micah for his idol. So the sin is really uh, sacrilegious. They don't have a judge raised up who's vying for the Lord. Instead, they've got Micah, whose mother of all people gave him an idol. He hires money. He hires, he gives money to a Levite priest to come be the priest for his idol. And now the Danites have come in and they're looking for an inheritance and they want to get this priest to come be the priest of an idol for them. And so you read this story and you're like, oh my gosh, everybody's sinning so much. And then you find out as you keep going in chapter 19, this Levite is staying in the hill country and he takes a concubine for himself. And the concubine, does she cheat on him? Does she go to her father's house? He's not happy and he goes to get her. She won't come back, and he's like, all right, I'm coming to get her. And he goes and gets her in chapter 19, and when he goes and gets this concubine, she travels with him, and then as you go on in chapter 19, there's no place for them to stay. So this Levite goes with his concubine, and they stay with this old man. This old man appears, and he goes, here, come stay at my house. And they go stay at the old man's house, and the old man's house gets surrounded by these horrible rioters, basically. And they, they say, get that man. We want that Levite guy out here. We want to have sex with him. It's really dark. And they go, no, we're not going to send him out. Instead, they say, we'll throw out my daughter, and we'll throw out the concubine. And they put this concubine out there, and you find out, and it says it explicitly, she gets raped all night by these men. And she somehow gropes her way to the door the next morning. And he's so unfeeling. The Levite's like, get up. And then he's seeing her listless. And come to find out she's actually dead. And now the rest of the sons of Israel are going, this is horrible. And she gets cut up into 12 pieces. They literally slice her body up on purpose into 12 pieces, and they deliver her body. Think of George Floyd. Isn't this interesting to be seeing this now? They deliver her body, and everybody, all the 12 tribes of, of Israel have to see, what is this? What, this is a woman's arm? Who is this woman? And going, somebody let her get raped all night. This is not the way of God. In the book of Judges, this is a horrible story, and the Bible lets you know this is not God's way. But there was no king. There was no moral leader. There was no judge. There, and now they've got a priest with an idol, and the mother is raising the kid in such a bad way. 
nobody's rating people righteously. And if you don't follow God's law and you don't have righteous judgment and there's no one to judge it, things get this dire. The book of Judges ends on a terrible note. Everybody's just doing right what's, what's right in their own eyes, just kind of like how it is today. And you finish reading Judges and you're, like, and you're just like silenced. And hopefully under your silence and you're stunned and you're shocked and you're horrified, under there you're like, we really need God to be our judge. If we don't go back to being under God, things are, this is going to be the new norm. And we can't have this. And this book gives us a prelude what happens when we don't have righteous leaders. It's my number one prayer. I pray all the time, oh, dear God, please, for righteous leaders. I cannot pray enough for righteous leaders. And we have to have the people be able to judge because if we don't judge, we won't elect a righteous leader. We won't insist upon having righteous leaders. We won't say, hey, if that righteous leader, if that person breached somebody's contract, we can't have that. If that person right there just went and did this to the women, we can't have that. If this person cheated and lied and stole, we can't have that. We can't have that. It's unthinkable. And judges, you know, comes from, then you got Ruth, and then boom, we're going to get into the stories of the kings. We'll do First Samuel very soon. I have it booked for Father's Day. Because we'll just keep clipping through the scriptures. And even though we're all unmuted, I can just feel your heavy hearts. <laughs> It makes me want to just sing praises to God, our King. I'm so glad we have a God who's strict. So glad we have a God who tests us. So glad we have a God who hates this. So glad we have a God who had the rest of the tribes of Israel say this is terrible. And God is trying to show us why it's so important to follow his statutes and his laws, to learn them, to know them, and to judge. Without righteous judges, all we're left is, is unrighteousness. So let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray a dedication of ourselves and of the whole, every living stone in the spiritual house of God. I pray that we would all rededicate ourselves, Lord, and praise you for your righteous, wonderful laws. Praise you, God, that you hate evil. Praise you, praise you, praise you. Thank you, my King. You're a great God. You're a great King. You're a great judge. You're a perfect judge, holy judge, righteous judge. Yay. Judge us, Lord, by your standards, we pray. And Lord, I pray, give us the moral courage to learn your statutes and be righteous judges. I pray that for every country, every authoritative position, every institution, every family, every mom and dad, and especially, 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 Lord, in the church, men and women alike, may we be so loving and kind and, and spread justice to those who are disabled and those who are professional athletes to the citizens, to the not citizens, to any kind of color skin, and men, women, it doesn't matter who. Everybody gets, everybody gets justice, Lord, in your way because you're just that great and that loving. Oh, my King, hear our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.